Thank you so much, Barbara, and, and thank you to John and uh, Sally, Susan, and everyone at the Rhine Center. Uh, it's always personally meaningful for me to uh, speak under the auspices of the Rhine Center because uh, JB and Larissa Rhine are two intellectual heroes to me. Um, I'm in the position of being a person who's never had the opportunity uh, to meet uh, his heroes. You know, many of the people who I view as um, sources of, of inspiration, sources of insight, people who help me find my own voice as a writer and speaker uh, passed before I, I came uh, into the subject matter that's come to define my life, which is the study of metaphys metaphysical ideas in history and practice. And <clears throat> JB, as some of you know, um, has been a particular source of inspiration to me, and I never miss an opportunity uh, when speaking about parapsychology in classes, uh, in the media, in books, to point out the solidity uh, and the gravity of J.B. Ryan as a man, as a researcher, and how tirelessly he labored to amass statistical evidence for the anomalous transfer of information in laboratory settings, or ESP. And one of the things that has always moved me about J.B.'s career and Luisa's career is not just the depth of their research and their absolute dedication to gathering impeccable data and taking every safeguard that a clinician can against the pollution or corruption of that data uh, in any way, but it was the manner in which they, they spoke about this data. You know, I hardly need to say this to most people who are on this um, presentation with us tonight, but perhaps certain things do bear repeating. Uh, perhaps we lose sight sometimes of the big picture, you know, in, in terms of what it is that, that we're working toward as people who have a dedicated interest in uh, questions of parapsychology. You know, I, I often say to people that if the entire parapsychological field had just stopped in um, the mid-1930s, and there are some of our interlocutors in the professional skeptics community who would be very happy to imagine such a scenario. So I invite them to imagine that scenario along with us tonight. What if the field of parapsychology, the clinical study for non-local intelligence, for extra physical abilities of the psyche, for the presence of extra physicality in our world, call it by whatever terms you wish, what if that had just for some reason or another stopped in the mid-1930s? It's interesting to realize that the card experiments, the Zener card experiments that J.B. and Louisa Ryan uh, performed at the parapsychology lab at Duke in those early years, those experiments in and of themselves would be enough to give us evidence of extra physicality, of extra locality. If we just look at the statistical data that they so painstakingly gathered where certain subjects would continually over tens of thousands of trials evince evidence of higher than chance rates on a five suit deck of cards and that this material was gone over and over was juried was reviewed was penetrated by every kind of transparency everything was included Null set, something that I always rush to point out to people is that J.B. Ryan was actually one of the pioneers in the social sciences in exposing null sets and all data um, in the documentation of his experiments. Very important thing to point out by itself. The very fact that over tens of thousands of trials JB was able to demonstrate that certain individuals continually and 
repeatedly in a replicated, documented, transparent manner, safeguarded against any kind of clinical pollution or compromise, evince the ability to glean information in ways that surpassed ordinary sensory experience. That statistical data in and of itself opens the door to the infinite. Do I exaggerate? Am I being hyperbolic? Consider, I mean, once the individual or certain individuals can be demonstrated to exchange information in ways that exceed ordinary sensory experience, once you've gathered unimpeachable statistical data, as JB did, that demonstrates anomalous transfer of information, you've effectively demonstrated non-local intelligence or the extra physicality of intelligence. And in cracking open that door, in cracking open that door, you've opened the door to infinitude. You've opened the door to an expanded view of the human situation that goes beyond cognition or uh, motor skill, flesh and bone. You've begged the question of the existence of a non-local field of intelligence, call it what you will. Some people use the term unified field. Infinite mind, the ancient Greeks used the term nous, which meant like a kind of overmind or infinite mind. The scientist and mystic Emanuel Swedenborg spoke of a divine influx. Some speak of infinite intelligence, the creative field. Call it what you will, call it what you will. You've demonstrated human participation in some field of intellect that goes beyond the physical. And this begs all kinds of questions of the survival of human personality after death, of the question of the infinitude or the immortality of some aspect of the psyche. We have terms for this. You know, we, people speak in terms of spirit or soul or what have you, but these are just words that we're using to try to find some consensus around ineffable experience. Perhaps, you know, JB's findings, if we were to stop even there in the mid-30s, put us in front of more questions than they do answers. But the questions are the questions that have animated the deepest human wish to know since time immemorial, literally since time immemorial. I remember years ago discovering that there were remnants in the Negev desert of an altar uh, that was more than 25,000 years old. That was more than 25,000 years old. That primordial human beings, our primordial ancestors, uh, had built in order to uh, worship the moon, to pay homage to the moon. And, you know, upon learning this, I, I, I fell to my knees, you know, with, 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 a, uh, with a sense of emotion and with a sense of, of, of tears, you know, in my eyes and felt choked up because I thought, wow, you know, this is one of the oldest relics that we possess of our ancient common ancestry. And what were these profoundly ancient men and women doing? They were looking for a larger sense of self. Of course, you know, there were different things that needed to be done in order to make life manageable. You know, reproduction, hunting, agriculture, shelter, warmth, all necessary or we wouldn't be here. But in addition to those activities, they were seeking a higher sense of self. And well, I can't even fathom the years, you know, 25,000 years. You know, it's hard to fathom. It's hard to fathom. I mean, this was primordial human life. Seeking a higher sense of self. A connection to the cosmos a connection to an infinite greater surrounding 
world that wasn't physically touchable, that wasn't a palpable tactile experience, but that they felt as real, sufficient, so that they took time out from the necessities of daily survival, and they included within that retinue of core activities that sustained life um, the worship of something greater, a greater force. I can barely use the words, but if you move forward 25,000 years, a, 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 a span of time I can't even quite imagine, but if you move forward 25,000 years, if I can even speak in those terms, you know, here you have these experiments that demonstrate that primordial men and women were right, were right. They do have a connection to something greater. We do have a connection to something greater. And these experiments that JB did, if you were to stop the clock right then and there, tell us that, provide evidence for that, comport with the testimony of seekers from time immemorial. And I don't use that as a figure of speech. I use that quite literally. And that's one of the things that he and Louisa did. One of the things that he and Louisa did. There's been so much more since then, obviously. The field has gone in so many different directions with precognition experiments and experiments in retrocausality and the Gonsfeld experiments and a whole wide range of experimentation for which brilliant figures, brilliant figures, including Jessica Utz, Dean Radin, Daryl Bem, men and women associated with the Rhine, a whole range of figures struggling in an atmosphere where funding is very difficult to come by, even though, as we all know, uh, the funding is very economical. Parapsychology is probably, arguably, arguably the most economical field within the social sciences. And yet the funding, obviously, because of polemical debates, is, is very difficult to come by. And yet struggling against those odds, and those of you who have written grant proposals are well aware that writing grant proposals is a, a career in and of itself. But you've done it, you've done it, and you've gotten the funding, and you've kept this search alive, you've kept this scientific search alive. And so much else has gone on in the generations that have passed since those early days. And yet if that's all we had, if that's all we had, that material uh, would still justly be called visionary, visionary. And it's extraordinary, you know? And when I speak about parapsychology in the media, I guess maybe this is a, um, a tribute uh, to JB. I speak about it in terms that could be considered somewhat conservative because JB was always conservative in the um, implications that he drew from his own data. If he were here tonight, I don't know if he'd be comfortable with me talking about doorways to the infinite and so forth. You know, JB was very reserved, very conservative in talking about the implications of his data, and that, that has been an influence on me. And uh, I was on a very popular podcast several weeks ago, and the host said to me, you know, um, what you're talking about, you know, uh, we could we could take it in such wild directions, you know, it, 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 it's so provocative. And I said, you know, I dig that, of course, of course, but I'm, I'm trying to be purposefully conservative about the material. And he said, I, I hear that. I, I hear that in your descriptions and I appreciate that. And I said, you know, the reason I'm trying to be purposefully conservative is because just the, the basic facts themselves are extraordinary. We as a human, community have never come to terms yet with even the basic facts themselves of what JB accomplished. And I believe, and I'm not somebody who's uh, waxes optimistic about changes in paradigms or epics or turnovers in human awareness or anything of that nature. Um, but I do feel uh, that maybe, maybe, within the time that, that we're living right now, uh, the public is going to be in a position to revisit some of this material because we are in a, in a state right now as a human community where on one hand, there's terrible divisions. I don't need to tell you about all the cultural and political and national divisions. It's, it's gravely, gravely serious. 
without detracting from any of that at all, we are, as a human community, I believe, also, right now in the here and now, experiencing in a real way a renewed appreciation for the numinous. And I say that with care. Part of the reason I say that is because I feel that we are living through a moment right now that's unique because, among other things, the, 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 the question of the, um, the UFO thesis since about 2019 has gone mainstream. The UFO thesis is mainstream. With the release of um, Navy cockpit videos, with the release of, or first the leak, first the leak, and then later the, 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 the validation um, of uh, uh, high-definition videos that uh, the Pentagon and Department of Defense uh, has had uh, on file with the realization, with the uh, admission following leaks that um, contrary to uh, what the public has understood, the um, military has continued uh, its study of UFOs uh, for the past couple of decades, and um, the recent nine-page report that the Department of Defense released, uh, citing uh, close to 150 uh, examples of uh, UFO-related activity uh, for which the DOD said it had no uh, explanation, and, um, and that these sightings uh, uh, evinced uh, a advanced technology that was not presently known to exist on this planet right now, not among the Chinese government, not among the Russian government, and uh, there was the admission of an unknown. And different presidents, including Barack Obama, are on record as saying, yes, there are uh, aerial objects that we have impeccable records of and no explanation for at this time. So, you know, dig that. Whatever other backstory is going on, you know, we are experiencing at this instant in our generation the mainstreaming of the UFO thesis. You know, when I was a kid, if you talked about UFOs, yeah, some people were interested, but most people, a lot of people, would say, oh, you know, swamp gas, weather balloons, delusion, little green men, nonsense. No serious person says that anymore. No serious person says that. I remember in 2019, I attended a panel at the Guggenheim Museum here in New York City, where I'm speaking from, on the subject of UFOs. And this was unusual because the Guggenheim is not known as a fount of occult passions. And it was, it was, it was a moment. It was a moment. And the curator came up to me and he said, let me ask you a question. At what point do you think it's going to be intellectually embarrassing in our culture for someone to just out of hand dismiss the UFO thesis. And I said, you know, honestly, literally, right now, right now, no serious person anywhere, whether in the military, the arts, any walk of life, a teacher, science teacher, biologist, chemist, everyday person, no serious person would issue just a blanket dismissal of the UFO question. Now, this is not directly related to parapsychology necessarily, but it opens us to questions of, of the numinous, of the greater, of, of dramatic and unimpeachable exceptions to the, the straight story, you know, that we grew up with, where we understand, you know, time is linear and events are singular and if you can't see it, feel it, smell it, touch it, or taste it, it doesn't exist. I mean, most of us, most of us probably grew up in that kind of atmosphere. I certainly did. Yes, you know, there was space made for religious worship, but, you know, depending on your background, well, you know, that's on a Sunday or that's on a Saturday or whatever. You know, that's not something that goes on on, you know, Tuesday at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And now we're realizing Tuesday at 2 o'clock in the afternoon is a lot stranger than we were brought up to to understand. The UFO thesis brings us to questions of interdimensionality because one of the arguments that was forwarded by my friend Jacques Vallée and that I think has, again, you know, is more and more entering the mainstream. Jacques, as some of you know, is a distinguished uh, UFO researcher and um, 
a venture capitalist. He was uh, one of the researchers who helped develop the earliest version of the internet. And uh, you know, Jacques made the point going back to the late 1960s that if you use the reasoning of Occam's razor, which says the simplest uh, answer that covers the greatest number of bases is likely to be right, um, he's made the case, I think very persuasively, that the working thesis of interdimensionality is easier, is easier applied to the UFO question than is the challenge of craft spanning the vast, vast distances of space. Interstellar travel is tougher to theorize than interdimensionality. Today we have theories of interdimensionality that are enormously involving and in some cases very persuasive. Some of these theories go under the rubric of what we call string theory. One of the variants of string theory is that metaphorically speaking, um, although we're not really sure if it's strictly a metaphor, I should be clear about that, all of reality exists along these, this, this network of strings. Every particle, every universe, everything that is a thing, regardless of its vastness, exists along this network of strings. And we, the human species, dwells within a certain dimension, a certain universe, along one of these strings. And there are activities going on all the time, always and everywhere. Microparticle activities, subatomic activities, macro activities, activities that involve mass events, like a black hole or a supernova, in different dimensions or universes along these strings. And everything affects everything else, which would provide us with certain explanations for why, for example, infinitesimally small or large objects mirror one another at a distance, or why, for example, our classical models of quantum mechanics, now going back 90 years or so, not only suggest but necessitate the existence of simultaneous events, the existence of an infinitude of events, events that exist within superposition, that only get localized, that only come into the awareness of the individual observer when someone makes a decision to take a measurement. Make a decision to take a measurement, and that which existed in a so-called wave state becomes localized to a particle state and exists in one place, whereas interference patterns have told us that that particle previously existed in an infinitude of spaces. And if that particle existed in an infinitude of spaces, that too means that there's an infinitude of outcomes, not in potential, but actually, but actually. Because you have different events going on simultaneously. The great physicist Erwin Schrodinger conducted a thought experiment called Schrodinger's cat, where he demonstrated that if you were to take a house cat and again, this is a thought experiment, and I'm speaking of a version of it. If you were to take a house cat and put a collar around its neck that had a poisonous device on it, and that device got tripped when exposed to a single particle, single atom or subatomic particle, and you put that cat into one of two boxes and then he directed an atom, a single atom at the box, and then you went to check on which box the atom went into, would the cat be alive or dead? Well, of course, all common sense tells us, well, that depends, right? If the atom went into the empty box, the cat would be alive. If the atom went into the box with the cat and the cat was wearing this collar with the poisonous device that got tripped by exposure to a single atom, the cat would be dead. And Schrodinger said, no, no. In point of fact, both outcomes are real and both outcomes are actual and simultaneous because at one time we can demonstrate that when that atom was in a wave state it was in both boxes and it became localized only when an observer made the decision to check so you would have to have a dead alive cat not one or the other but a simultaneously dead alive cat and for that matter if you waited 
some period of time, let's say eight hours before checking the boxes, not only would you have a dead alive cat, but you would have a cat, a living cat that was now hungry because it had been left in the box for eight hours. You actually created a history. You created a future. You created a present. And that's one of infinite simultaneous events. How can this be? It's surreal and yet necessary if our quantum physics models are real. I often say to people that if our jury clinical ESP data is not real, then our statistical model is flawed in some way that we do not yet understand. Because this material has been replicated over and over and over again. I may get to some of that later. It exists. It's been meta-analyzed. It's been juried. It's been written about. It's been repeated. So if, if there's something wrong with our statistical models for testing for anomalous transfer of information, then there's something wrong at the foundational base of how we conduct clinical research. But if we're going to accept that there's nothing wrong with how at this point in time we conduct clinical research, we have to accept the evidence for anomalous transfer of information. Likewise, Schrodinger was creating his thought experiment to compel his colleagues to accept the outrageous implications of their own data. String theory is a model that at least helps us to unify events in this quite clearly surreal reality in which we live. So, bringing things back to the UFO thesis, is it possible? Is it possible that when we experience UFO phenomena, we are getting glimpses of, or intersecting with, or encountering events, or material, or beings that exist in other dimensions along this string? Is it possible that a great deal of enduring anomalous testimony could be attributable to the same thing? We give these things names. We call them Bigfoot, or we call them Loch Ness Monster, or we call them Poltergeist, or we call them Crisis Apparitions, or we call them Ghosts, or we call them Dead Alive Cats. But it could be that we live in this world. I'm using world in a very broad sense. We live in a reality that exists along these strings and is not only affected by things that are going on in other dimensions, either on a particle or a macro level, but, but in fact, sometimes we crisscross with events in these worlds and we struggle to find ways of, of talking about these things or we struggle to find ways of statistically documenting these things. But isn't it extraordinary, you know, that, that we can really be having this discussion in a concrete way in the 21st century? And it's impossible to say these questions, you know, they can be waved away as uh, illusory. There's, there's been a change, you know. We really can't wave away these things as, as illusory any longer. And, you know, it's possible that maybe we get glimpses of these interdimensional uh, events when we're using very fine instrumentation. Um, so in the particle lab, when a scientist is measuring something, or for that matter, in the parapsychological lab, depending on what kinds of experiments are going on, he or she is using exquisitely uh, fine systems of measurement. He or she is gathering data using very, very finely tuned uh, systems of measurement. Well, you know, what, what, what are our senses other than organic systems of measurement? 
We detect climate, distance, smell, height, perspective. And we're measuring the world as we experience it, at least. So perhaps there are certain individuals who, at certain moments, are capable of an exquisitely fine measurement. And they have an experience. And as it turns out, in certain cases, perhaps those experiences can not only be statistically demarcated, but maybe, maybe, can also be physically recorded by the means that, that we possess right now. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm making some leaps here, but we as a generation have to make leaps to at least theorize, well, you know, what is a delivery system for ESP, for example? You know, what is an explanation for um, this advanced technology? Maybe it's earthbound technology that we don't know about. That's possible. But shame on us, you know, if we exclude other questions based on important testimony and data gathering. So maybe it is more efficient for us to think in terms of interdimensionality than to really grapple with the questions of how a physical craft could travel over the unthinkably vast distances of space. You know, these are all questions that we face today. We face broadened questions about the nature of the mind. You know, we're seeing studies in placebo research that's like nothing the field has seen since it uh, was, was born as a identifiable field of study immediately following the Second World War. We have seen the efficacy of placebo surgeries. It's hard to believe. We have seen placebo studies in which large numbers of people have reported lasting relief being administered a transparent placebo. There was a famous experiment using transparent placebos at Harvard Medical School in 2010, where a group of sufferers of irritable bowel syndrome were separated into two different groups. One was a control group, and they were given no treatment whatsoever. And the other, the study group, uh, was given uh, a so-called <clears throat> transparent placebo. They were told that they were being given an inert substance. You know, usually placebo studies, of course, are based on a decoy substance, a sugar pill or what have you. They were told they were being given an inert substance. And 59% of the people in the active group reported sustained and lasting belief versus 35% of the people in the control group. And in, in, in such studies, that's considered very statistically significant. So just the suggestion if I can extrapolate, just the suggestion of the efficacy of the mind-body connection was sufficient in and of itself to generate the placebo response. It's quite remarkable, and it ties into something that JB had uh, uh, determined from his own research. I, I referenced earlier how incredibly conservative JB was in drawing um, implications from, from his research. And uh, in the afterward to a British edition of his monograph, uh, Extrasensory Perception, originally published in 1934, J.B. made the observation that um, one of the critical factors that determined whether there would be any results at all um, with a subject was uh, a presence of conviviality in the lab, uh, uh, the subject being dedicated to the uh, the card experiments, uh, an absence of fatigue, um, enthusiasm, prevalence of uh, uh, comity in the lab among the researchers and the subject. So uh, in short, in short, um, hopeful expectancy, hopeful expectancy to speak uh, cumulatively, seemed to be the, 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 the critical factor uh, in determining whether results would appear. So if a subject was bored, fatigued, uninterested, results would spike. If they took a break, had a cup of coffee, had a conversation, went outside, whatever, 
uh, results would, would go up again. So ho a hopeful expectancy, enthusiasm, conviviality seemed to correlate to results. And I thought, wow, you know, only J.B. Ryan would, would make that as an afterthought. You know, this is monumental because the field of modern placebo studies hadn't even gotten started yet in earnest. And here he was, you know, putting his finger on what seems to be the trigger for what we call the placebo response, which is hopeful expectancy. So the question is, you know, how can we engender hopeful expectancy uh, without deception or decoy? Uh, how can we generate hopeful expectancy uh, giving the patient uh, accurate information? You know, some physicians have a problem with placebo studies because they feel, well, you know, it's a benevolent deception. You're still deceiving somebody. And there's truth to that, you know. So the question for our generation becomes, okay, so, you know, obviously the patient is owed accurate information. So how do we foster this atmosphere of hopeful expectancy that seems to trigger uh, results in the ESP lab, results in the placebo lab, uh, without resorting to a, a decoy substance? You know, these are very, very big questions that we face today. And uh, there's a, a psychologist, Ellen Langer at Harvard, who has also done uh, experiments in the mind-body connection using transparency. Um, several years ago, she did a study with uh, hotel mates. And um, Langer and her collaborators found that um, uh, uh, many hotel maids um, are... Uh, obese, um, suffer from hypertension, high blood pressure, um, maybe have uh, body fat to muscle ratios that are not ideal. And, 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 and Langer uh, was, was perplexed by this because she said, hmm, it's odd, you know, because um, by definition, you know, hotel maids are, are laborers who are, you know, they're on their feet all day. They're moving around. They're doing aerobic and anaerobic activity. You know, why should those physical markers, which are a problem across our entire culture um, and in other nations, why, why should these workers be experiencing that? And so Langer and her colleagues uh, got together, a group of uh, working hotel mates. And um, again, they were divided into two groups. One was a control group, and the control group uh, just continued on with its with its work with no intervention whatsoever and the other group the active group um, was given now dig this was given um, accurate information about the aerobic and anaerobic benefits of their work you know pushing a vacuum cleaner walking up and down flights of stairs changing bed spreads um, you know stuff work you know and scrubbing and so the active group was given accurate information about the aerobic and the anaerobic benefits of their work, okay? And they went off and they were monitored. The control group was monitored. Everybody went back to doing their work without any physical changes whatsoever. No changes in routine, no changes in extracurricular activities, no changes in anything at home, same stuff. The group that was given accurate information about the physiological benefits of their work demonstrated weight loss, improved muscle to fat ratio, lowered blood pressure, um, greater uh, oxiniz uh, oxinization, you know, greater stamina, all kinds of factors that we look for to demarcate physical health based not on any change in routine, but only on having been given accurate information about the aerobic and anaerobic benefits of their work. That was all. And that was enough to trigger measurable bodily body changes from weight loss to improved muscle mass to lowered blood pressure. Not to mention general improvement in, in mood and... and lowering of anxiety levels. Just that. So transparently offered and accurate information was sufficient
to reverse markers that we associate with ill, Ill health. So the question is, you know, how applicable is this? In what situations yield to it? What situations don't yield to it? How can we find ways to harness and define these qualities? So it's very exciting to me because we live in an era where, again, I think the question of numinosity, the question of interdimensionality, the question of the efficacy of the mind to actually shape and concretize events in the physical world, our ability to track, record, demarcate these things, this all exists. It all exists. So my hope, of course, my hope, of course, is that more funding becomes avail available for parapsychology research, that the polemical atmosphere that professional skepticism has brought to bear on study of the parapsychological gets toned down. We need to tamp down the rhetoric. You know, we as a human community have to be able to study these things, and as alluded, it's not very expensive. These are not expensive experiments. They're infinitesimally small compared to budgets that are spent on other psychology experiments, all of which I want funded too. But I would like to see the funding um, situation loosen up a little bit. We as a culture can certainly afford it, and other cultures uh, can afford it. And, and I want to see the uh, polemical qualities get toned down around this stuff. You know, we've had enough of the polemical skepticism. You know, I think the parapsychological community, including a number of people on this call, has really dedicated itself to framing its work in a way that's, that's very responsible, that's not exaggerated, that's not far out. There's plenty of exaggeration in our culture and, you know, some of it exists within the New Age world and it gives me a headache. <laughs> <laughs> and when I identify it, you know, I try to cool it down, I try to tamp it down. But that's not a problem uh, within the parapsychological community. And I think, by and large, the parapsychological community ha has really, really made a terrific effort to um, frame its data and its material in a very, very sober way. And, and benefits have come from that. I think great, great benefits have come from that. And it's a tough battle, you know. But I think, I think that the, the rhetoric, you know, coming from within the professional skeptic community, um, it needs to be tamped down, you know, at this point. It needs to be tamped down. And um, I, want to, um, I want to wrap up by telling you uh, two stories about unusual events to which I was uh, privy. Uh, the first story involves uh, a man who um, belonged to a very deep, intellectually driven, um, esoteric, philosophical, spiritual uh, organization that was dedicated from a spiritual perspective to studying some of the stuff that we've been uh, talking about. And um, this particular organization, which sometimes uh, taxed people's physical abilities and, and, and limits, uh, was organizing a winter camping trip. And for any of you who have ever been winter camping, you know it's grueling. I remember years ago I was going on a winter camping trip and I asked one of my best friends to come with me. He adamantly refused. And I said, you know, why won't you come? And he said, because the best you can possibly hope for is to have a terrible time. And he was correct. But for some reason, we as a human species feel the need to winter camp. So <laughs> off I went. But anyway, getting back to my story. Um, so the organization of which this man was a part organized a, a winter camping trip. And... Uh, a teacher uh, within this organization, a senior person, uh, came to this man and he said, listen, um, 
and there was a little bit of humor in this, but but it was it was told to him seriously. He was given a task. He was told, um, uh, "We're going to go out and we're going to get some buckets, uh, so that the female members of the um, the group, uh, if they need to uh, relieve themselves at night, don't have to go off into the freezing cold woods." And uh, uh, your job, uh, he told uh, this man, is to go out and uh, get. Um, Pink heart-shaped buckets, kind of a strange request, right? Pink heart-shaped buckets. And these pink heart-shaped buckets were going to serve as uh, chamber pots, in effect, uh, to go into the uh, tents of the female uh, campers so they didn't have to go traversing into the woods if they needed to relieve themselves in the winter night. Okay. So uh, so he said to the man, listen, uh, so you got to go buy these Pink heart-shaped buckets, you got to find them. Now, if you come up blank, this guy lived in New York City. If you come up uh, blank, then you can resort to buying uh, red buckets, okay? And so uh, the man went off and um, he looked all around New York City for these pink heart-shaped buckets, came up blank. I mean, went everywhere. Went to hardware stores, bed bath stores, contractor stores, you name it. Nothing. Big city, lots of stores, commercial hub, nothing. He couldn't find pink heart-shaped buckets. So then he decided, well, all right, I'm going to go to plan B, and I'm going to go look for these um, uh, red buckets. Maybe they won't be heart-shaped. Maybe they'll just be regular, round, red buckets. Now, that sounded to me like a pretty easy task. But... Again, made phone calls. This was a little bit in the pre-internet days, but uh, still. Made phone calls, went to hardware stores, home decor stores, whatever. Couldn't even find any red buckets. And he thought to himself, this is nuts. And he tried, and he really, really tried. Didn't want to disappoint his teacher, didn't want to disappoint himself. He had been given a task to do. And uh, he made his best efforts. And he thought to himself, well, look, you know, I'm going to have to call my teacher and tell him, listen, I tried, but I failed. And so the guy was standing outside of a, uh, like a local neighborhood grocery store, and he was going to take out his cell phone and call his teacher. But something told him, you know, don't do it just yet. Just wait for whatever reason. So he had to just go run some very ordinary errand at this local kind of nothing grocery store that was uh, nearby his uh, apartment. So he goes inside the grocery store, walks to the back to the frozen fruit section to get milk or eggs or something. And what does he see? A pile of brand new pink heart-shaped buckets just at the point that he had been prepared to give up, just at the point that he had been prepared to give up after making every single effort possible and holding off just that one last instance, there appears this extraordinary event where in the middle of this nothing little neighborhood grocery store, there's the coveted item for which he had been searching. And uh, the man grabs the stock boy and says, you know, what's with these buckets? And the stock boy says, they, I don't know, they just came in today. True story. True story. Now, um, skeptics will say, well, you know, there's a law of large numbers, which says, sure, it might be unusual for that to happen, uh, in the life of an individual, but we live in a big world, so by definition, unusual things are going to happen. They have to happen to somebody somewhere. And my response to that is, yeah, but actuarial tables are really very good at measuring things across large populations. But what they can't measure is the, the stakes in the game that a person has emotionally. The meaning of the event in the life of the individual is a wholly infinite and heightening aspect 
of occurrences. It wasn't just that the unlikely occurred, although that was part of it. It was the emotional stakes and the profundity of meaning and intimacy that the event had in the life of, in, of, 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 uh, in the life of the individual that no actuarial table can quite get at, that the law of numbers, large numbers, can't quite get at. I want to leave that aside for a second and tell you another story that happened to another man. This man was this man was uh, getting married um, in uh, California. And um, his bride, uh, his fiance, uh, was from uh, Germany. And uh, she, uh, they met. Uh, they were getting wed uh, here in the, in the United States on the West Coast. Um, she had been uh, raised by her mom and um, by her grandfather. Her father uh, died at a young age. And um, her grandfather, uh, Walter, uh, died when she was still a, a young woman. Um, maybe about age 16 or so. And um, he was a very meaningful figure in her life. Uh, he was a figure of profound and deeply intimate uh, importance in the life of this woman. And uh, she uh, owned some of his personal effects, heirlooms, which were very meaningful to her. And so some of his effects, uh, his possessions, were shipped uh, to the United States so that they could be uh, part of her new uh, home she was making with the man that she was marrying. And um, the man she was marrying uh, told the story that uh, among her, her grandfather's personal effects was this, this old transistor radio you know, going back to the 70s and um, hadn't been used in a very long time and he was hoping to uh, do something uh, nice and meaningful for his, uh, his, his, his wife-to-be and looked into seeing whether he could get the thing working again. So he put in fresh batteries, wasn't working. He looked at the circuitry to see if he could solder it, if there was some way to fix it, and nothing worked, nothing worked. So, you know, unfortunately, he took the thing and just put it away in a desk drawer somewhere, as we do from time to time with, with old stuff that we can't get to work, but that maybe we have an emotional attachment to. So um, they had the wedding ceremony. It was at home. Uh, and uh, his uh, his new wife said to him, "Listen, there's you know there's something I want to tell you. I want to you know talk to you in private." And they they went back into the bedroom, and she said, "You know, uh, I'm so happy, but I I miss my grandfather terribly. I I feel such an emptiness that he can't be here with us today." And and they heard music, and they couldn't figure out where in the world are we hearing music from. And th they had no such device in the bedroom. They checked every possible place. They even opened up a back door to see if maybe one of the neighbors was playing music. They could not crack it. And then they realized that the music was coming out of the previously broken transistor radio. And the man's daughter said to him that when the couple was in the bedroom earlier getting ready for the, the marriage ceremony, she too had heard music coming out of their room. They hadn't heard it. She had heard music. And this radio that had been mysteriously unworkable that belonged to her grandfather was playing a, a beautiful, sweet love song at the moment that they were having their exchange. And they went back to sleep that night uh, and they fell asleep to that radio playing classical music. And it never worked again. It never worked again. And the man to whom this happened was somebody who considered himself a very, you know, hard-headed rationalist guy. And he said, hey, I know all about the law of large numbers. I get it. But what the law of large numbers doesn't really measure is the emotional impact of an event, the emotional stakes, meaning, and intimate value of an event in the life of the individual. And just as my new wife was talking about missing her grandfather, that we would hear a love song coming over this previously unworking and thereafter unworking transistor radio shook my sense of materialism to its core. Now I want you to dig this. Do you know who these men were? 
the guy in the first story with the pink buckets was me. That happened to me. The guy in the second story with the mysterious transistor radio, that was the professional skeptic, Michael Shermer, writing a column in Scientific American. My story appeared in January 2014 in my book, One Simple Idea, which is a history of the positive mind mo movement. Michael's story appeared in October 2014 in Scientific American. I had never known his story until quite recently. It came to my attention as I was doing some research several months ago for a class that I was teaching. He and I, the seeker and the skeptic, were making the exact same point, the exact same point. And I invite you, I invite you, the listener, take a look at the story in my book, One Simple Idea, published in January of 2014. Take a look at Michael's column in Scientific American, published in October 2014. See if I haven't rendered these things accurately. Test me. We were making the exact same point. And it led me to wonder, is there really such a chasm between the responsible seeker and the responsible skeptic? Or is it all just the convention of polemics? And if it's just the convention of polemics, let's get rid of the polemics. Let's search together. Let's stop trying to treat everything like a chessboard or to flip over the chessboard if the game isn't going well for us or what have you. We don't need it. We don't need it. What we need to do is follow the example of a, of a JB and Louisa Rhine and, and let's search. Let's really ask the question, you know, what is out there? What is around the next corner? What can I see if I climb up to that ridge or if I climb up to that peak? Let's ask what life is in a complete way and in a real way, not worrying about who's going to win the debate, but forgetting about the nature of the, the debate. It's so secondary. If someone like me, who's dedicated his life to the metaphysical search, and someone like Michael Shermer, who's dedicated his life to his version of, of skepticism, are making the same point, then it has to suggest that we live in a generation where there is possibility for real discovery. And I ask us to, to seize this moment together, to take this moment together, and let the best of our capacities lead the way. And I thank you all very, very much. It's, uh, it's been a great pleasure to be able to speak to you tonight. And um, I'll be happy to hear uh, questions, comments, and to have an exchange. Thank you. Thank you, Mitch. That was really wonderful. And I have to say your Twilight Zone background kind of drew me in <laughs> right to you and throughout that whole talk. It was really wonderful. You know, what you're talking about, about people from different backgrounds being able to come together. This has been something that's been so difficult in our in our lives lately because people have become so tribal. Yeah in their behavior, so tribal in their beliefs that we tend to pick a tribe and stick with it. And it's hard to hear the other side. And, you know, one of the things that within our field of parapsychology, uh, we have courses at the Rhine where we teach parapsychology at the Rhine Education Center. And a current course we have going on right now is a skeptical view of parapsychology. Oh, how wonderful. Because we, we want our parapsychology students to hear from the skeptics perspective, what their beliefs are and how they come to them. Yes. We yes. want, you have to know the other side and we have to listen to each other and really hear what the others have to say. And I think that's what your stories were, were illustrating there at the end. Yeah, I think that's wonderful. And I, my hat is really off to you for, for hosting that kind of a class. I think that's absolutely wonderful. And, and that, that, that's so educative, that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the amazing things about it, and I don't want to go into it in too much detail, but one of the amazing things about it is that 
the skeptical perspective is not what I would expect it to be. <laughs> There's, I'm learning more and more. And I've studied, you know, the skeptical perspective, because you always have to know about the other side when you're a researcher to understand where you can make advances. Mm -hmm. But it's different than even I thought it would be. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's really nice to have that coming in. We have a uh, Kenny Biddle, who's a well-known skeptical blogger, who's to teaching that course. That's wonderful. So a, yeah, so it's really Bravo. wonderful. Bravo. Mm -hmm. Um, so there were a couple, were a few questions that came up as you were talking, and I want to tell everyone: if you have questions, please put them in the chat, and I'll be happy to, to pass them on to Mitch so that we can continue with this. Um, you were uh, talking, you know, I'm going to go way back to the beginning when you were talking about J.B. Ryan and null sets and what he what he discovered, and can you describe what the significance of the null sets? are and why they're important oh sure you know in certain instances uh you know in, in any um uh social science uh psychology clinical experiment um you might just get no results whatsoever and uh uh or or you might get results that seem uh, schismatically uh, retrograde or absent and before uh, JB uh, began his parapsychological research, very frequently um, social scientists from all fields would not report null sets. They would just keep those off to the side. And that's classically referred to, perhaps over referred to, as the file drawer problem. And uh, there was a certain generation of skeptics that would constantly invoke, among other things, the file drawer problem and insist that parapsychologists were not reporting their null sets. Now, uh, in October of 2020, uh, we saw the passing of the famous uh, professional skeptic uh, James Randi. And uh, I wrote uh, an article uh, very critically assessing uh, James's career. I quoted John in it. Um, detailed article. Uh, called The Man Who Destroyed Skepticism, and it was published on the website uh, Boing Boing, where it can be read for free. Um, one of my many criticisms of, uh, of James was that he prepared a classroom guide for teachers to teach uh, school kids about parapsychology from a skeptic's uh, perspective. Uh, I'm making a stretch, I think, in using the term skeptic uh, in this case, um, in teaching about parapsychology from James's perspective, which was that it was all nonsense. And in this guide, um, he stated uh, to s teachers, you know, folks who are teaching, you know, middle school kids and such, uh, that uh, Ryan didn't report null sets. And uh, not only is that uh, factually inaccurate, but in fact, uh, JB and the parapsychology lab at Duke were among the pioneers in the social science field in general in reporting null sets, in, in being transparent about everything, all data sets, all data sets. I'd like to say the parapsychologist uh, Daryl Bem at Cornell, who published some famous precognition experiments in 2011 and has since subjected those experiments to uh, repetition, those experiments you'll hear sometimes, you know, parapsychology experiments are not repeated. Those experiments have been repeated and validated um, 90 times in 33 different laboratories in 14 different countries. 90 times in 33 different laboratories in 14 different countries. BEM released all of his data, released the software that he used to track his data and made it free of charge to anyone for the asking. And this is in an underfunded field. So um, I'm saying that as a kind of uh, adjunct to the point that I was making, which is that JB uh, was among the pioneers in the social sciences in general reporting null sets. And I thought to myself, you know, and I don't understand human nature. I mean, <laughs> I've been in this business for a long time and I don't understand human nature. I thought to myself, and I think I've briefly discussed this with Sally Ryan and with John Kruth, James had to have known that. You know, so why would you put out a classroom guide saying that JB didn't report null sets? I mean, it's just factually wrong. I just don't fully understand human nature, you know. 
And so forgive me, I've probably uh, expanded on the question uh, more than was necessary, but, but that's, the, um, uh, uh, that's the issue of null sets. And, and JB was an absolute pioneer in, in, in the field of social sciences in general in reporting all of his data, whether it was a null set where there was no result, whether it seemed schismatic, uh, whether there was the, the, the supposition that maybe some mistake was made, he reported everything. Mm-hmm. So uh, yes, you're 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 correct about this, and you know uh, we actually had Daryl Bem speak to us earlier this year. Oh, good, cool. <laughs> and so his video is in our video library for anybody who's interested in learning more about what he did and and what he released. Um, but you know, going back to JB, uh, you know, it was a standard practice in all sciences that you would only report successful experiments the good stuff yeah <laughs> if, if your hypothesis was not accept it was not supported you didn't report it because it wasn't a good experiment in those terms right but right. jb and jb did the same thing in some of his early releases of the journal of parapsychology but shortly afterwards he realized the value to science of knowing what worked and what didn't work right. because it helped the whole field to advance and so i think as many as many often happens when we're talking to skeptics, they'll take a small bit of truth yeah. and expand it to be all of the truth, when really it's still just a small bit of truth right. and there's a lot more around it. Yeah. So, um, you know, uh, you know, I just wanted to talk to you a little, you know, you were talking about Tuesday afternoon being this amazing moment in time. <laughs> Were you like thinking of the Moody Blues, you know, and Tuesday afternoon? Oh, no, I wasn't. But I dig your association. I also like the music that you played at the lead in. I haven't heard Alabama Getaway in a long time. I wasn't, but I like the association. (laughs) Well, I would say, you know, thinking about the Moody Blues and um, leads me to start thinking about Timothy Leary also, Mm -hmm. which is another song they did. And I was wondering what your if you have any thoughts on the connection between uh, the mo- more modern type of research that's going on with psilocybin and psychedelics. Yeah, and psychology. I, I very much appreciate you bringing that up. I, I didn't mention that, and I, I had intended to say a word about that. You know, also in terms of people becoming open to numinosity, there is a whole new wave of experiments, as John was alluding, into uh, microdosing, the, the use of entheogens, uh, psilocybin, uh, to treat PTSD, uh, to treat... Um, um, different uh, traumatic disorders to treat uh, ADD, to treat OCD. And I think these experiments are very promising and the public is, is opening uh, state by state, state by state. You know, it's going to take years, it's going to take years, but there's legislation getting written state by state that make it easier for uh, psychologists or psychiatrists to prescribe uh, some of these uh, substances. And I, I sense nothing but wide openness, you know, on the part of the public to uh, experiment with psilocybin and, and microdosing and so forth. And, you know, these things might be considered accelerants. And um, people are under such terrible stress uh, that especially, you know, coming out of the lockdown, which I hope is winding down. I mean, none of us know. But people are under such terrible stress. I think accelerants are absolutely necessary. Um, and of course, you know, there's, there's the uses of different forms of meditation as well. I'm dedicated myself, personally speaking, to transcendental meditation. I think that's also an accelerant. I think that really helps the individual. There have been wonderful strides made in studying the um, positive effects of transcendental meditation on uh, PTSD, uh, high blood pressure, D- different forms of st- stress-related disease. And so, you know, if, if meditation, uh, meditation has attained uh, um, complete mainstream acceptance as, as, a, as a therapeutic a tool. And I think that uh, psychedelics are uh, approaching uh, mainstream acceptance as a, psychedel- as a, as a therapeutic tool. And uh, both of those things um, in different ways, uh, heighten uh, the 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 efficacy of thought, uh, and and in this case, thought as a as a healing uh, tool, and um, maybe maybe uh, some of the effects of of certain entheogens are to heighten sensitivity. Um, William Blake would call it to cleanse the doors of perception. 
So if meditation cleanses the doors of perception, if psilocybin cleanses the doors of perception, if microdosing cleanses the doors of perception, that's one more thing that opens up the individual to the numinous, and, and I think it's very promising. So, uh, yeah, I think it's wonderful some of the new, new experiments that are being done with these drugs that were so long ignored because they were considered dangerous, but they're yeah. finding there's a value in certain aspects. But there's a lot of people who, well, first of all, they don't feel comfortable do doing those, and other people who just, they can't do those mm -hmm. things. And you talked about meditation, but there, are there other ways... I, Bitch, you've written extensively on positive thinking. Mm -hmm. Are there other ways that people can find this mental state and find find a way to develop this expectancy to create their world? Right. Well, one of the things that I use uh, as a daily exercise is I I experiment with using the the hypnagogic state, which is something related to the Gonsfeld experiments. Um, Hypnagogia is a, is a term uh, that's used within neuroscience and by sleep researchers to describe that exquisitely relaxed state that you find yourself in just in the moments before drifting off to sleep at night. It's, it's kind of a, it's a borderline state where you have cognizance, but you're also, you're deeply, deeply uh, relaxed and you might be experiencing hallucinatory or dreamlike images but you're also still capable of directing your attention. You have self-awareness. And the great parapsychologist Charles Onerton uh, found ways of replicating the hypnagogic state in, 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 in people outside of the sleep cycle by using comfortable sensory deprivation. And he found that that was, in effect, a prime time uh, for um, instances of uh, telepathic uh, activity, and he would document uh, one individual uh, so-called sending an image, another individual receiving uh, an image, and um, in, in the Gonsfeld experiments, which were conducted, they're still going on, they were conducted chiefly in the 70s and 80s in their heyday, while Onerton was still uh, with us. Um, those experiments, like JB's uh, card experiments and telekinesis experiments, found a, a statistical spike, but in this case, that spike was in evidence during the state of hypnagogia. So anyway, I say this because you enter this state naturally twice a day, just as you're drifting to sleep at night and just as you're coming to in the morning. The morning state is sometimes called hypnopompia. It's slightly different, but it's similar. Exquisite relaxation, cognizance, control over your attention, but a very, very supple, suggestible state. I use that state to repeat affirmations, to use visualizations, sometimes to engage in prayer. It is prime time for self-suggestion and for a very, very, a kind of um, mental suppleness because it seems to me that during hypnagogia, your rational uh, barriers are down. So if you're trying to, let's say, recite an affirmation or something like that, um, you're going to meet with less rational resistance um, from your normal waking mind. Uh, the great French mind theorist Emile Coué uh, is famous for prescribing the mantra day by day in every way I am getting better and better. And what critics of Coué's missed is that his, his genius was in, 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 in his early instinct for prescribing that people use that mantra during the period of hypnagogia during this uh, period of drifting to sleep and coming to in the morning, he prescribed repeating that mantra very gently, whispering it very gently about 20 times. And uh, so before neuroscience even arrived at a term like hypnagogia, Kue, along with a number of other uh, things, had a very early instinct and insight for that. So that's an exercise that I do. I mean, I literally don't let a 24-hour period go by uh, without using that hypnagogic state to, uh, very often twice a day. And of course, um, self-hypnosis yeah. is an active way to get into that state, a similar state, if not the same state, mm -hmm. and to be able, and it's it, it's a very suggestive state. Yeah. Your subconscious mind tends to believe what you tell it. Mm -hmm. Even mm -hmm. if consciously you don't believe it, your subconscious will believe it. And if you can get the information into the subconscious, sometimes it'll surface more. Yeah. Um, and and I, I wanted to mention, you were talking about Charles Honerton. 
-hmm. and specifically referring to the Gonsfeld. Charles Honerton was someone who came along after JB had done his experiments. JB did his studies back in the 30s and 40s. Honerton was doing his in the 70s, uh, but also working in Durham and then up in New Jersey for a bit. But he, he famously was working directly with the skeptic, That's Ray right. Hyman. Right. There was, they were at odds with each other and Honerton reached out and said, let's work together and make this and make this whole experiment better yeah and so it goes back to what you were speaking about earlier as yeah. well it was unprecedented he and uh, i think it was in 86 uh, he and ray hyman who's a psychology professor at the university of oregon noted skeptic still living today um they collaborated on a paper and uh, in that paper um hyman the skeptic said look uh, i don't believe in the esp thesis but uh, I affirm that uh, a, a meta-analysis of the data that Honerton and I have gone over together demonstrates that it's, it's unpolluted, it's uncorrupted, it's sound data, and it begs further research and question. And I thought to myself, that's it. You know, that's all we need to bridge this human divide. You don't have to agree with me or somebody else about the existence of, of something called ESP. Just let's pursue the question. Let's pursue the question. And uh, I'm melancholy about that because... 1986 was a long time ago, and that hasn't repeated. And I'm 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 melancholy that that hasn't repeated. But boy, when I came across Shermer's piece, I thought to myself, "Wow, we're saying the same thing," you know. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, he's definitely reaching out in the in a similar way and admitting his vulnerabilities and his uncertainty. And that's where you have to be as a researcher, as a scientist, yeah. evaluating this. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit. There, you know, people often say thoughts are things. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that concept. Sure. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, there was a uh, Methodist minister named Warren Felt Evans who uh, coined that term. Uh, I think it was in, maybe it was 1876 in a book called Body and Soul. And it was later popularized by a journalist named Prentice Mulford. You know, the idea being that a thought is an actual concretizing event. And these guys were speaking and in, in, in religious terms, in spiritual terms, and we can still, of course, speak in those terms today, but what we found, you know, a apropos of some of the placebo studies I was describing and the, the hotel maid studies that Ellen Langer uh, devised at Harvard, um, can, how can one dispute that thoughts are things when you see that, you know, thoughts, in, in the case of the hotel maid study, in the form of accurate, transparent information, translate in a matter of weeks into weight loss, improved muscle mass, lowered blood pressure, and that's just the that's just the the, the the glacial tip of things. The glacial tip of things, you know, we've seen again and again extraordinary um, evidence of thoughts having concrete effects on materiality. The field of neuroplasticity is based entirely in that. The field of neuroplasticity, fairly recent field, uses brain scans, MRIs, to demonstrate that sustained thoughts will, over time, uh, alter the neural pathways through which electrical impulses travel in your brain. And, I mean, the, the founder, or one of the founders of the field, a uh, psychologist, research psychologist at at UCLA, uh, Jeffrey Schwartz, uh, makes the contention, look, you know, this demonstrates that thought evinces an actual force. It evinces an actual force. It's literally mind over matter. I mean, literally mind over matter. You know, you're seeing the gray matter of the brain demonstrably change, the neural pathways alter and change based on sustained thought. And this data is not controversial. No one questions the data from the field of neuro plasticity. What's controversial uh, is the implications of the data. And Schwartz has been wonderful about saying, look, you know, here's the data, but, but we have to actually, as a, as a research community, come to terms with its implications. And the implications is that thought events is an actual force. Yeah, it's, I mean, of course, thoughts are, ideas are things. Mm -hmm. Yep. Thoughts are things. I mean, how could you say that they're not things? It's hard to even yeah. con conceive of that. Um, and so there was another question that came up earlier, and I don't want to. I don't want to let it go by. You were talking about string theory and about these different strings, and um, how does how do you see that relating to psi phenomena? Does it give some sort of explanation on how certain things might work? Well, it's a it's a fascinating possibility. You know, if we have, and and this is this is just 
theorizing, but if we have If we have to come to terms with the implications of the Schrodinger's cat experiment and accept that reality is in infinitude, reality is in superposition, that infinitely simultaneous events are going on at once without any uh, limit, and that this is a necessary aspect of uh, reality, and, and, and marry that to the fact that we know, we know, from Einstein's uh, theories of, of, of time and relativity and, and experiments since then that have validated his theories that linearity itself is an illusion. Linearity itself is a necessary illusion. We know, for example, that the experience of time slows down at extreme speeds. The experience of time slows down in um, instances of extreme gravity, like inside of a black hole. So the experience of time itself, we know, at least intellectually, if not as a palpably felt fact most of, most of the time, um, is, is illusory. It's a necessary illusion that we, as, 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 as five sensory beings most of the time, may need to get through life. But it's not there. It's not real. It's not actual. We see that there are exceptions to it. Hence, it's, it's not really a law. So... If things are going on simultaneously, if things are going on in a state of infinitude, if time itself is demonstrably non-linear, then it may be possible that that stuff that's that's an actuality, whether it's an event, whether it's a picture, whether it's a card being flipped over, whether it's an image that I'm attempting to convey to somebody, whatever it is, you know, it already exists. It's already going on. And, and, and it's not bound by time, and it's not bound by singular dimensions, so it's possible that you might have a sensitive individual or you might have individuals in general under the right circumstances who are able to take a finer measurement, as it were, take a finer measurement, and their perception is, 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 is heightened so that they're able to glean a piece of information from this, this this infinitude, from the infinitude of events that exist outside of time, outside of monodimensionality, uh, along this vast, n infinite network of strings. So maybe it's a question of, of finer, finer measurement being possible under certain circumstances or among certain individuals. And, and you know, we, we call it the future, we call it the past, we call it the present, but in fact, those are just terms that we use to try to come to grips with this, this infinitude that exists all around us at all times, albeit at different points on the so-called string. So we don't see it or experience it all the time, but it's there if we can find ways of taking finer measurements. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and a lot of people talk about these things in terms of um, living in a three-dimensional world, but only having a two-dimensional view of it. Yeah. So you don't see the full full, until you rise above it, you don't get to see the full three dimensions right. and we being in a three dimensional or four dimensional world including time having the ability if you're able to rise outside of it and view it from an outside view that may give you more knowledge and ability to stretch beyond what our normal perceptions are seems that einstein was able to conceptually do this in some states and was able to make some uh make some statements that other physicists didn't see at that time Yes. So perhaps there's also some people who are expressing what we consider psi ability in a laboratory who are getting a glimpse in a similar way and able yes. to get yes. some information from other areas. Yes, so. yes. And uh, so, there's a term, if I may, in um, quantum physics nowadays, information leakage. You know, people sometimes ask the question of how come all this surreal stuff that goes on in the particle lab isn't visible in our macro world and some quantum theorists will speak in terms of information leakage, and they make the contention that when you're measuring things with, with very finely calibrated instruments, you're gathering more and more of what's really going on. And William James, the great philosopher and parapsychologist, uh, made the observation in his Gifford Lectures in 1902, which became his book, Varieties of Religious Experience, he made the observation that the mystic sees things as though under a microscope he or she sees this vast range of things that are going on 
and then as you pull the microscope back, you get less and less data. And that is essentially the same thing as information leakage. And, and so, so many quantum theorists are making the same point today that James made in 1902 using different language. But it's basically saying the same thing. He spoke in terms of the mystic. They spoke in terms of the you know, fine calibration of instruments. But they're making the same point. Well, Mitch, we've covered so much area tonight and so many different topics. I know people are going to have other questions and they're going to want to know more. Where can they learn more about these things? Where can they find out more about where you're, what you've been doing? Well, let's see. Uh, I'm online at MitchHorowitz.com. Um, please uh, join me on social media. I'm on Twitter at Mitch Horowitz. I'm on Instagram at Mitch Horowitz 23. I write about some of this in my book, The Miracle Club. I write about some of this in my book, One Simple Idea. Uh, I'm working on a new book called Daydream Believer, which is up for pre-order on Amazon, and, and I write further about it there as well. Well, that should give people a little bit to go ahead with. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I think MitchHorowitz.com, that will give you the basis. You can go there and you mm -hmm. can learn about all the different things that Mitch is up to and what he's going to be up to in the future. Mitch, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Pleasure. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Is mm -hmm. there anything you'd like to say before we go tonight? I just am so grateful that uh, everyone at the Rhine Center, uh, John and Susan, Sally and others are um, keeping the flame of this study and this work uh, alive. It's, a, it's enormously important and uh, we're, we're living through a uniquely uh, propitious moment for parapsychology.